campground beside the Blue Heeler Hotel at Kainuna in northwest Queensland was our starting point for our run down the Diamantina River to Birdsville near the South Australia border. And what better place to start a trip than at a good old Aussie pub. As is situated on the busy Landsborough Highway, there are always plenty of comings and goings in Kainuna, including visits to our campground by some of the locals. If you like character in a pub, the Blue Heeler has plenty of that, with a history that goes back to the Cop and Co days. There is not a lot else in Kainuna, but you can get fuel and information at the nearby roadhouse. The roadhouse also has a caravan park. The night before leaving on our adventure, we had a great time at the pub, soaking up the atmosphere and enjoying the last bit of civilization we were to experience for a few days. Yes, in a pair of dusty The first destination on our trip, following the Diamantina River, was the Combo Waterhole. The historic area is the closest that you can get to the headwaters of the Diamantina on public roads. The two kilometre walking track that leads to the Combo Waterhole cross retaining walls called shotovers that the earlier graziers had built in an attempt to drought proof their holdings. This walk was very interesting, but it was the Combo Waterhole itself with its connection to Australian folklore that we had come to visit. This is a very special place in Australian history as it is believed to be the billabong that inspired poet Banjo Patterson to write the words to what became later on as Australia's unofficial anthem Walsing Matilda. According to a photo on the information board, it must have been a popular place for family gatherings under the shade of the Coolabar trees. After backtracking a short distance from the waterhole, we turned onto the old Landsborough Highway. The old highway gives access to sheep and cattle stations along the river and once served as a stock route and coach road. It wasn't long before we came across a small cemetery situated near the site of one of the coach stops, the old Dagworth Hotel. At these coach stops, fresh horse teams would be harnessed and ready for the next coach. And the reason for the cemetery? According to the plaque, many travellers fell victim to illness, thirst and exposure. Sometimes they died by the roadside or at the hotel, or even on the coach, and were buried here. The distribution of sheep was very sparse on the near arid land, and most of the cattle were happy to hang around the water troughs topped up with artesian bore water by the windmill. kangaroos and camels were also competing with the livestock for the rare green blade of grass. At the turn off to Cathedral Hill and Farewell Stations was a creative sign that was worth a closer look. Keeping left at that intersection we travelled another five kilometres before swinging right onto the Dix Creek Eldersley Road.
The terrain up to this point had not changed, with little or no geological feature. But now we were coming across a few tributaries or channels that give the country its name. And then there were a few bumps on the horizon. Suddenly we came upon bitumen. This was the Kennedy to Bellamental Road. We turned left and after 11 kilometres swung to the right onto the Diamantina River Road. The site of Old Cork Station was the destination for our first camp. It was lunchtime and we were looking out for a place to pull over for lunch. Perfect. We hadn't seen another vehicle all day and had no fear of being showered in dust by passing traffic. Wrong. A few jump-ups caught our eye as a relief from the endless floodplains. A small timber railing off to the side of the track got my curiosity. It turned out to be an enclosure for a very dry rain gauge. Approaching Old Cork Station, two intersections need to be negotiated to get back onto the Diamantina River Road before taking the turn off to Old Cork, half a kilometre further on. Once we made the turn to the campsite, we were met by the welcoming committee, who after checking us out, politely let us past. After selecting our campsite overlooking the river, we had a closer look at the homestead ruins. The lease for Cork Station was taken up in the 1870s. Local materials were used wherever possible, which includes the sandstone stonework. Ideally situated beside the permanent Cork waterhole, the substantial homestead was built shortly after the formation of the Darling Downs and Western Land Company. Sir Thomas McElraith, Queensland Premier around that time, was one of the major partners. It is said that the homestead was built to provide an appearance of progress and prosperity, hoping to attract the interest of investors and bankers. There is a sizeable area of level ground beside the river suitable for camping.
it was most pleasant to sit and relax beside the river after the dry and dusty roads of the day. As the morning sun warmed our campsite, a couple of willy wagtails were having a territorial dispute. We were back into the flat plains again for about 60 kilometres or so before entering more interesting jump up terrain. While travelling through this area, we were able to add wild pigs to our list of non-native animals seen so far. As we moved along, there was more green growth pushing its way through the red soil. We are now heading for the Diamantina National Park where we plan to camp for two nights. With the southwestern travel came a transition to minor sand dune country where prevailing winds had heaped Diamantina sediments into linear mounds. At the next section of jump up country we put the drone up to get a bird's eye view of the colourful landscape. The channels are highlighted by rows of vegetation. There is little left at the ruins of the old main hotel. Established around 1888, it ceased trading in 1951. Still recognisable among the ruins are the remains of the underground cellar that would have been used to keep food and drinks cool during those heat waves of 50 degree days. It's like a wild time was had here, going on all the bottles and glass lying around. Like the Dagworth Hotel, it would have been a popular spot for the coach traveller. And it also had its own small cemetery. Just a short distance on is the entrance to the National Park. We still have to look out for bulls, not to mention stretches of bull dust. Further into the park is the turn off to a lookout called Janet's Leap. This vantage point gives a view over what is called Diamantina Gates, where the channels converge as the rivers squeeze between the Goida and Hamilton Ranges. As we had planned to camp at Hunter's Gorge, it was just a matter of following the signs. We were soon set up on a pleasant site overlooking the river. 
Both the two main campgrounds in the park have toilets and fire pits. Camping chores complete, all that was left to do was to sit and watch the pelicans cruising up and down the river. The next morning we drove the short distance to the other main campground, Gumhole, on Whistling Duck Creek, just to check it out. Here the sites are tucked away in a wooded area, giving more privacy. There was plenty of bird life around, but we didn't see any pelicans. The Warakuta circuit drive is 90 kilometres in length and meanders through a mix of landscapes, including sand dunes, sandstone mesas, Gibber Plains and River Channels. In 1992, the former pastoral property was sold to Queensland Parks and Wildlife, and there are still many relics left of the earlier pastoral era. Once on the move, we travel through vast clay pans and gibber plains, where the track was hardly distinguished from the surrounding area. At the Bronco Yards, the plaque described how the rail in the middle was used to hold a lassoed beast, while tasks such as branding were carried out. Lake Constance and Hunter's Gorge are important wetlands that support breeding populations of many resident and migratory birds. The history of the Diamantina Lake Station, established in 1876, was a flood and drought, boom and bust, with some huge losses of cattle during its Kidman ownership in the early 1900s. Cattle were removed from the park in 1998, but we came across the occasional herd. Warakuta Waterhole we will never forget. After carefully making our way through the long grass to take a peek at the water hole, Anne went back to the car to get the water bottle. As she closed the door and turned, she stepped on a snake that had come out of nowhere. The equally startled reptile shot under the car, winding herself around the rear axle. I gingerly crawled into the car and drove away slowly, hoping it would drop out which it did. A cup of tea was in order after that little incident. 
A snake bite kit has since been added to our first aid kit. Green Tank is a dam with an earth wall and concrete spillway constructed in the 1960s to be a reliable water source for the cattle. Scattered around the edge of the dam were a whole lot of shells. These turned out to be the shells of freshwater mussels. These are often found in dams and ponds, and in fact they help to purify the water. Back at our Hunter's Gorge camp, the pelicans were settling in for the night. Next morning, as we travelled further south, there were many changes in the road surface and the surrounding vista. But there was a constant, it was always flat. A little over 50 kilometres from Hunter's Gorge, we entered Davenport Downs. Covering a total of 1.5 million hectares, it is the largest cattle station in Queensland. Primarily a bullock fattening operation, it is said to have the capacity to carry over 29,000 head. At the signpost, we turn right towards the Devonport Homestead and Monkira. buildings associated with the homestead could be seen in the distance. Water supply for the station relies on a network of bores as well as the Diamantina River and Fars Creek which run through the property. Beyond providing a source of water throughout the year, these waterways typically flood about a quarter of the property during the wet season producing a reliable supply of feed. The road passed through a series of channels which recently had been wet and were cut up. We almost shot past the small cemetery near Monkira Station Homestead. The few headstones here told a sad story of sickness and isolation. William O'Donoghue escaped the plague but died of beriberi, a disease caused by a vitamin deficiency associated with a poor diet. Monkira Homestead marks the end of the Diamantina River Road. We now turn right onto the Diamantina Development Road and headed towards Baduri. The road is also unsealed but is wider and regularly maintained. The landscape though on this 120 km stretch remains featureless with barely a tree to be seen. 
At an intersection with a road off to the left is an old steam engine. This is number three bore. Artesian basin water was crucial for the opening up of this land and many bores were sunk in the 1890s. Most bores were sunk to about 500 metres, while some were sunk as deep as 2,000 metres. This was a huge undertaking in its day when you consider that the steam engine had to be transported in pieces by bullock dray and assembled on site. In this case, it probably wasn't financially viable to relocate the steam engine once drilling was completed. If you don't need to go to Baduri for any reason, you can take the road off to the left as an alternate route to Birdsville. We continued on to Baduri and topped up with fuel. After Baduri, we headed south on the Air Developmental Road on our final leg to Birdsville. On the way, we pulled over for a closer look at a stand of wadi trees. These were acacia puce, considered one of Australia's rarest plants. They are extremely slow growing and can live for hundreds of years. Pastoralists used to use their highly durable and termite proof timber for fence posts and stockyards. They are now a protected species. Birdsville is one of those outback towns that pretty well every Australian has heard of and has been the destination for four-wheel drivers and adventurers for many years. It is well known for the annual Birdsville races in aid of the Royal Flying Doctor Service and the Big Red Bash. We took a final look at the river a few kilometres out of town at the Karajuru Bridge. It's at Birdsville that the Diamantina River is confined to a single channel before fanning out on the edge of the Simpson Desert. In very wet years, it can even reach Lake Eyre. Back in town is another body of water, the Birdsville Billabong. Also back in town is the iconic Birdsville Hotel, established in 1884. And what better way to finish a trip than at a good old Aussie pub? Mm -hmm.